it's slightly dangerous because I'm talking about what I think is the status quo of the creative industry at, at, at large, because you can't necessarily change the philosophy of how you measure the ROI of the output of the creative industry if you don't understand the status quo of the creative industry. Uh, and that's kind of what we're covering. On today's episode, we'll be talking about the philosophy of measuring ROI on non-recurring marketing investments. So who's this for? Anyone in the C-suite, a CEO, a CFO, a CMO, you know, up there in the Fortune 500s, all the way down to someone who identifies with being a founder or partner in a startup. And of course, uh, a segment that I'm really interested to talk to are uh, second generation and third generation businessmen who come from family businesses in the country who are looking at modernizing either their entire business or sections of their business. That's true. All the more I even see large companies requiring this sort of a refresher in, in this particular subject because a lot of the bad practices that our industry has been inflicted with, there are two sides to this coin and it's come from both ends. Oh yeah, it takes two hands to clap. And uh, I know that I'm going to be pissing off a couple of people from our industry today because uh, I am opening up uh, Pandora's box and discussing what I think are some really bad practices that have affected the way clients deal with the industry and uh, and it's you know kind of like this vicious circle that has developed correct and nobody's really benefiting no one's really benefiting i've structured the show into four broad arguments which will then support and amplify the meaning of four uh, insights that people can take away and apply to any ROI calculation or algorithm that you're using to compute the ROI of investments that you think you're making in what you label, uh, you know, marketing assets, so to speak. Let's get on with it. Let's start the show. When you think that something as intangible as design and communications can't really affect your bottom line, you usually end up with marketing and advertising tools that don't help you inherently mitigate your business risk. And that's what this podcast is about. A behind-the-scenes look at how we go about doing what we do, mitigating business risk. I'm Jude Lazaro. And I'm Mark Lazaro. And you are watching our weekly video podcast. So you mentioned there were four uh, arguments that you want to touch upon today. What's the first one? Uh, I've called the first one reversing the trend of fragmentation. It's a slightly historic point because if you trace the history of uh, the creative industry, what's happened over the last 20 years is that the creative business has just fragmented into smaller and smaller and smaller components. And... Um, fragmented to a point where the client is actually confused as to how to compute value that's coming from multiple vendors and multiple deliverables. Mm -hmm. So this um, highly deliverable specific or deliverable oriented approach is what's causing this entire thing to fall apart. And the result of this fragmentation is that almost on the broadest level possible, the expertise that is within the creative business has been sapped out of it. You present a client with fragmented deliverables as interface points that are not being delivered by one company but by multiple companies. Okay. And he then will take that same approach with you, totally weeding out the expertise that you bring to the table. Um, confusing? No, no, it's not confusing. It's, it's extremely evident. The industry has fragmented into really, really small bite-sized pieces and nobody's holding the expert angle on this. Absolutely. And that's the key. Like, you know, let me demonstrate that with an, with an example. You get a, you know, a pain in your stomach. It lasts for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to a doctor. Yeah. You walk in, you say, hey, doc, I got this pain. Three days, four days, it hasn't gone away and it's in my stomach. Now, you're not going to follow up that first conversation with the doctor by saying, can you give me some idea of how much it will cost me to fix my stomach? Ridiculous, isn't it? But that's how most businesses approach creative companies and ask them to pitch. They go, give me an idea of how you can fix my stomach. You go, I have no clue what's wrong with your stomach. Yeah. Now let's play out this, this, this doctor you know, analogy a little more. So you meet the guy and obviously he's going to sit there, going to look at you, he's going to ask you a bunch of questions, he's going to do his thing. But there's, a, there's diagnosis involved. There's also expertise involved because he could possibly give you an answer which is super simple. He says, hey, this is a bug that's been going around 
and you know there's so many cases that have walked through my door here's a bunch of medicines take it you know see how you're feeling in three days you should be fine man and you leave that's that's one possibility second possibility is he says uh, I think I have an idea of what you have take these medicines but call me back in three days you call him back in three days and say listen this pain is intensified he brings you in for a second session mm. at that second session he possibly then says I need these three tests and he's asked for deeper diagnosis okay. he's also dug into the different companies or experts within his sphere which is medicine you come back with the results and then there could again be two possibilities he says oh I now know the exact bug and I know exactly how to fix it and he gives you a prescription with medicine okay. the second thing that could come out of that second uh, session that you had with him is he says you need surgery now look at where your first touch point, you know, touch point was and look at how ridiculous that question sounds this is what's happening in the creative industry today my first point ends here it takes two hands to clap the creative industry has definitely done repairable damage by fragmenting and micro monetizing mm. and presenting this interface of deliverables yeah. that the client now does not know how to value it's as ridiculous as saying you know what give me a quotation to fix my health because I have a stomach pain but I want to negotiate the price of that blood test you might do and that surgery that you might do yeah. it's illogical to approach it that way it's just not a good way to go about doing it mm. we're going to have to do some damage control here to reverse this okay moving on to the second thing I want to talk about is there value in the sum of the parts is there value in these fragments that you're buying are you talking to four or five or six different companies from the creative industry and are you putting aside your time to put all of the pieces that they give you together because if you are then you're going to love this point because clients have ended up having to develop the expertise to put all these pieces together right now the reason that I bring this up is I don't think the creative industry knows what it's selling because it sure as hell shouldn't be selling deliverables it should be selling expertise so if it is selling deliverables then where's the expertise coming the industry the creative industry is expecting you to put them together and make yeah. sense of them yeah. right and I can amplify that by maybe using a really silly example you wanted to meet with someone you know you have a business meeting and uh, you decided let's just go get a coffee at a five-star hotel what's that experience feel like it starts when you drive in get out of your car smart salute walk into this beautiful lobby pipe music a beautiful woman in a beautiful dress that points you to the you know to the to the coffee shop you go there great guy shop chap great service you order a coffee you finish your meeting and that, that bill arrives and you look at it and there's one line item on it and it says coffee 550 bucks or 750 bucks there wasn't anything on that bill that said smart salute great lobby pipe music pipe music pool view great view of the city none of that was built to you that was part of the experience just say so you tell me hey I think I can get a five-star coffee experience cheaper apart from having to find the best chef who got the right ingredients and made you the coffee if you had to source the lobby and the pool view and the sexy girl that smiled at you and the guy who served you and put it all together yourself do you think you'll be able to accomplish it at 550 bucks absolutely not not right so what seems like a really expensive coffee is not expensive at the end of the day why because it was somebody else's job to put that together not yours I end up actually thinking I'm getting that coffee done cheaper but eventually we'll end up with a bill that's uh, if measured will prove way more expensive yeah if we take that analogy and bring it over or pour it over to the creative industry today the creative industry is selling coffee sometimes even just coffee beans it's selling the view to the to the city it's selling the poolside seating it's selling um, smart lobbies it's selling pipe music it's selling all of these little components now imagine I told you let's see if I took the expertise that a five-star hotel has to put all these pieces together and deliver a 550 rupee experience around coffee could you replicate that you can't because you don't have the expertise to do it but the creative industry today is expecting you you know to put out micro payments for all of these deliverables and then put them together and that's ridiculous you know to bring it back to your, your, your previous example of the doctor it's the equivalent of landing up at 
the scan guy getting the, the blood test guy, getting the, the, the medical store guy and telling them all to give you individual pieces without the doctor involved. That's another way of looking at it. You, you worked the doctor out and you just went to each one of these guys and said, hey, you give me these little pieces and I'll figure this out and get healthy myself. Yeah. This is a, a, a sick situation that we've both created. And it's reversible. It's definitely reversible. Now, a quick point that I'd like to make here uh, which segues, you know, kind of smoothly into, into the third thing that I want to talk about is the fact that because of this highly fragmented deliverables approach, mm -hmm. I think customers are extremely confused about recurring design cost and non-recurring design investment. It's kind of why I worked in non-recurring into the show title. Because non-recurring is a subject that all of them, I'm talking C-suite, CEO, CTO, CFO would all be able to identify with a non-recurring engineering cost that you need to incur when you develop a product. Why am I not hearing that language in marketing? Correct. Because the creative industry is not offering it. They're used to the concept, they're used to the buy-in of investing in, in a platform. Yeah. But they, they don't even think about it when it comes to marketing. Yes. Yeah, you're right. The third thing I'd like to talk about leans on the popularity of concepts like, you know, lean and agile and Kaizen. Let's talk about the word Kaizen. You know what I'm talking about, right? When I say Kaizen, continuous improvement, because you're not thinking about the difference between the recurring and the non-recurring investments that you should be making in the creative, in, in creative assets or marketing assets, you are not getting a relationship with the industry that can bring broad spectrum recurring value or recursive improvement value you're aware of this you you're implementing these these systems uh, you know ad nauseum throughout your organization and i don't see them affecting the relationship with the creative industry what are you losing when you don't improve something here's an example are you willing to buy the alpha version of a phone or the beta version of a phone or would you much rather buy version 4 of it? Because you know, mm -hmm, these guys have had a couple of runs around the block. Bang, I'll take it. Okay. You can't build the perfect asset on the first go. You just can't. You need to improve it over time. You know, and to add to that, what we do, and we, we see this every day, you may create an asset for company X, but the learnings from that asset can change drastically in company B. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, with any confidence, state that this will work for the lifetime of this product. Because the context is changing. Absolutely, on a daily basis. In fact, your learnings from week one are irrelevant on week two. That's how fast things are changing today. So yes, it's impossible without recursive development. Connect that to the, C to the previous point, which is I have non-recurring investments. The non-recurring investments are when you sit and think mm -hmm. and say, here's the plan, here's the road map for my marketing assets. Here's the road map for my marketing uh, funnel. Look for partners that are implementing lean within their confines, that are thinking about Kaizen within what they do. You know, Stop looking at people that are just producing assets and individual assets. And you build and design that marketing funnel with a design company, with pieces of, if hopefully not all pieces of, but I see some of the pieces of this creative industry. That's when you're gonna get value. And you work out partnership deals with them so that they keep coming back and improving what they're doing. Now this is where I'd like to drop the bomb of the four key insights that you can take away from this talk. The first one is you should be measuring the value of a marketing asset by how deeply it integrates with your marketing funnel. Not by what it costs, but by how deeply it's integrated. It has to interface all the way from the advertising layer through the layer of discovery, through your sales pipeline, and through your CRM pipeline. If these assets are not integrating across that, you're buying the wrong thing. It's not going to work out cost effective. Second point, you have to have and build based on continuous improvement, Correct. right? Continuously improve that asset. You need a mechanism. There to have to be relationships that cause that asset that you've now deeply integrated into your marketing funnel to recursively get better. That's point number two. The third point is build these assets to have a long lifespan. Don't walk in with you know, overnight schedules. Don't walk in and say, I've got no budget. No, these are investments. You don't make investments overnight. You make investments after giving them a lot of thought. 
and you think about an investment in the lifespan of that investment. So make investments or build assets that are going to last a long time. Which brings me to the last point which is stop looking at micro KPIs that all of these deliverables that are being offered to you just you know readily yield. A ripe picking ground for this is you know the wrong KPIs from digital. How many leads are, you know how, how many hits are we getting a day is not as important as how long is somebody spending on your page. Correct. Which is also equally not as important is how many people are buying from you. Mm -hmm. And the clue is in insight number one. You should be looking at KPIs down the line in your funnel. Because if all of these assets are deeply integrated with your funnel, then the KPIs below start to make sense. Start to make a lot of sense. Right? Right, I've got one final argument to bring to the table. And it has to do with starting any creative conversation or interaction with the wrong keywords. And I've got four choice ones that I've put down there. Innovative, creative, fresh and new. I want something innovative, I want something creative, I want something fresh, I want something new. Here's what's wrong with that. You're going to become an experiment. They're going to experiment with creative, fresh, new ideas on you every month or every quarter. That's not a good investment. A recursive, improving, pointed in one direction idea is much better than innovative, creative, fresh, new ideas. You're starting this entire exercise on the wrong note. No, and for me, the biggest issue with those words is they're all words that are subjective. <laughs> they are words that really have no purpose behind them. I mean, they're great words, creative, mm -hmm. innovative, fresh, new, but it's subjective. What is something that's fresh? What's something that's creative? What's something that's innovative? What's mm -hmm. new? So at the end of the day, with a brief that starts with these four words, who's holding the baby at the end of the day, which is an objective end? Sales, conversions, money coming into your account. Well, like I said in my, my second argument, the expertise that's available in the industry has been moved off the table and you now are faced with a whole bunch of deliverables. Think about the fact that now, if you as a CMO or a marketing director or even a CEO are taking ROI decisions on investments in these fragments that you've made, it's most likely that you've built a certain muscle memory that you don't even know you have. And that is to take less risk with every recursive failure. If everything that you wanted from the creative industry was fresh, new, innovative, yeah. they are giving you alpha versions on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. You're the test bed. There's nothing improving. There's no solid numbers, which is why your ROI system is broken. And your best re you know, response and I've heard this from a CFO straight up in a meeting. He goes, hey man, this website can't cost as, you know, it's got, it's got to cost half as much as the last one. Because the last one didn't work. And the only way that he knows how to make those numbers met better and tweak his ROI calculation keep dropping those costs. is to keep dropping those costs. Yes. Well, there's actually an independent study. I don't hold it in high regard, but there is an independent study which has uh, looked into the historical value that has been exchanged between businesses and the agencies in the US and it's making the claim that agencies today are getting paid 40% less than what they used to get paid in the early 80s and the early sorry the late 80s and the early 90s now if that's true that's crazy that's absolutely crazy but i said they they're not getting that much value either. you're not getting the value you aren't getting the value so stop using words like innovative, creative, fresh, and new. You don't. You want an idea that works and that gets better. Yeah. You don't change the 54 spots on your assembly line every month if you were manufacturing bikes on an assembly line. You change the piece that didn't work. You make the improvement that, that brought your 64 second cycle down to you know 62 seconds because that means one more bike or three more bikes or 10 more bikes. Yeah, you don't want creative, new, fresh, blah, you don't want that. Change up my entire system. <laughs> yes, you know, this, this fourth argument might sound like a bit of a rant, and it is. It is a rant. You're using the wrong words. You're just leading with the wrong intentions. The philosophy of how you're approaching this is wrong when you continuously throw the words innovative, creative, and fresh. But what's happened is 20, 25 years worth of this has just caused both sides to have muscle memory going, what should creative industry bring to us? 
creative, innovative, new. How should we pitch to this client? Creative, innovative, fresh, new. It's, it's bullshit. I can't say anything else, it's just bullshit. Now I must say this this entire episode has been a I wouldn't say us hinting at, but you know, sort of a rally cry towards a desperate need for industries at large, the entire economy, to take this interaction point and this paradigm with a creative industry and change it around and turn it around to something more positive. And um, which begs the question, because I know we are biased because we've done it, do all creative agencies need to start taking risk? It's not for everyone. There's only a few of us in this industry, in the creative industry, that can make this move and lead the way. We're going to literally beta test and alpha test these methods forward. And a lot of people are doing a very good job of it. I can, you know, just off the top of my head, talk about companies like Fuse Project and a designer like Yves Behar, who's, who's taken this to the next level. You know, look at the number of companies that he's, uh, he's got equity in. Take companies like KTM and how a design firm, which took an equity level, you know, sort of in engagement with them, turned them around. Absolutely. Right? So it's going to take creative companies of, of, of a specific kind a lot of effort in recalibrating what they think is scale. I can only offer a subjective point of view that we have on the subject. We don't look at scale as just expanding the number of accounts that we have and the number of people that we have working in our company. We look at scale as the scaling of our clients' revenues and our clients' valuations. Because if we can then take a piece of that, we have then scaled. It's mathematics after that. It's mathematics. On that note, let's mathematically close this. <laughs> so don't forget to subscribe, like this video, comment on it, and most importantly, share it with somebody who can actually make a difference to this entire endeavor. Yeah. If you can share it with somebody who can actually change this paradigm that we as an entire industry are suffering from, it'll make a big difference. You know, more so share it with someone within your company that you think is a great partner who can lead your organization to being able to change the philosophy uh, and therefore change the way you interact with the creative industry. That's if you're a business owner. And if you're part of the creative industry, well, then the same thing goes for you as well. I, I think it's, um, it's time that we had robust debate like this within our company. So. If you're the one to lead the change, then hopefully this is, uh, you know, kind of ammunition in your gun. And if you need to reach out to us for help to figure out how we're doing, uh, what we're doing with uh, equity and uh, royalty deals, uh, we'd be more than, um, you know, willing to sit down and talk, uh, and talk, talk it over. So reach out.